Welcome to episode 88 of I Thought I Knew How, a podcast about knitting and life and all sorts. I'm your host, Ann Frost, and this episode was recorded on November 7th, 2022. Today, I'm taking you along with me to the Fiber Festival of New England, which takes place on the first week of each November at the grounds of the Eastern States Exposition, only about 30 minutes from my house. It attracts teachers and vendors from as far away as the Mid-Atlantic and Midwest and is one of my favorite festivals within driving distance. But first, I would like to thank my patrons for their ongoing support of the podcast. You all keep the lights on and cover the costs for equipment and such for the show, and I thank you for that. My patrons receive benefits as a thank you that vary depending on the pledge level. These range from a sincere thank you to quarterly gifts in the mail. You can learn more about those gifts at patreon.com slash I thought I knew how. And a huge thank you to Knit New Haven and Morehouse Farm for supporting the show as well. Knit New Haven is a welcoming yarn store in New Haven, Connecticut with supplies for knitters, spinners, and crocheters. Just a short ride out of New York City, New Haven is an excellent day trip if you are headed to the city this winter. Visit the Yale Art Museums, have some Frank Pepe pizza, and pop around to Knit New Haven for Clinton Hill cashmere, yarns from Harrisville Designs, and Pleister Project bags. Morehouse Farm is my favorite source for non-superwash merino wool. They have several different weights and types of wool, and the fact that it's not been treated to be superwash means it still has character and life. It's my favorite merino. I'm working on a cowl with it right now, actually, and so I'm freshly reminded of how great it is to work with. Find their yarns and extensive pattern support at morehousefarm.com. Okay, everyone, I have been to three instances of the Fiber Festival of New England, 2019, 2021, and 2022. It takes place in a massive agricultural building at the Eastern States Exposition Grounds, which is where the Big E takes place every year. The Big E is a huge regional fair for all of the New England states. The Fiber Fest is entirely inside, which means it's safe for vendors' products, and it's much more accessibility-friendly because it's on a solid concrete ground rather than dirt or mud. The aisles are kept wide so you don't feel crushed, even at its busiest, but they still fit a huge number of vendors into the space. They also offer classes and do things like shearing demonstrations. I started the day taking a spinning lesson on a wheel. This is my first time having a lesson on a wheel and probably my third spinning lesson, but the other two had just been with spindles. So drafting already came easily enough. And the teacher had to start with the footwork, just getting the wheel to spin consistently and consistently in one direction, and then had to spin using pencil roving and then switched us to actual roving, which had us um, start doing the drafting as well. So it was a very natural progression, and it felt really lovely and comfortable, and now I know what I want for Christmas. After the class, I met up with Amy, one of my patrons, and we had lunch at the food trucks, which are also inside, and we went around together and visited the booths. Some of you were there too and said hi and it was lovely to meet you. See, some of you already know what a great fiber festival it is. Before I left, I went around to talk to a bunch of the vendors who were there and the rest of the episode is going to be those interviews. I spoke with people who had some sort of product that was different, whether it was a breed-specific yarn or yarn from their own mill or a unique base or just like a total non-yarn product. Some of you are going to be curious about where you can find these things that we talked about, so I'll be sure to have all the information in the show notes for this episode. I'm just going to play the interviews back to back, and then I'll pop in again at the end, so please enjoy my visit to the Fiber Festival of New England. So I'm here with Susan from Jaggerspun in Maine. How are you doing today? We're doing great. Awesome. So you came quite a long ways to get down to us here in Massachusetts. Were you here overnight or did you make the drive this we morning? We were here overnight. We stayed with a friend in Hartford last night and we just love this show. So it's worth the trip. That's great to hear. You have so many beautiful yarns laid out here. Like we're, you have like a double booth, it looks like. Three booths, yeah. Three booths and just gorgeous collections of yarn and things laid out. Do you want to tell me a little bit about what you brought along? Well, we brought some of our best-selling yarns. We have our 50-50 wool silk in a light worsted weight, and we have some of our heather yarns put up into bundles, um, very colorful. 
Um, we have our new Gotland Heather, which is half undyed Gotland blended with our 100% um, top dyed wool Heather. We have some of our organic yarns, um, our green line, and some of that is naturally dyed at Green Matters Dye House in Pennsylvania. Um, and we have some undyed yarns. All our yarns in our booth are spun in Springvale, Maine. And where does the where does the actual wool come from? It depends on the yarn. Um, we source the wool from mainly from Argentina and the UK. Okay. Okay. Do you have any that are from U.S. sources? We don't at present, and that's a longer story. But that's because we are a worsted spinning mill. We need um, comb top, and there are very few places in the U.S. to get comb top. Yeah, there's lots of you know, along the supply chain issues with processing. Right. It's, it's much easier for us to get comb top in the UK than it is in the US. Yeah. Do you have anything coming up that you'd like to tell people about where they, they can, you know, find out more on your website or? Um, you can always see all our yarns on our website and whatever's new on our website, um, jaggerspunyarn.com. Um, we keep that up to date with lots of you know, whatever's new. It's not the prettiest website, but it's everything's there. And well, the important thing is the prettiest yarn, right? Right. right. That's where we put our effort. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. So I'm here with Sandy from Longmeadow Farm, and you have a beautiful booth here with gorgeous yarns. I've been watching it on Instagram. I saw a picture last night, I think, of the setup progress. So I wanted to make sure I came by and saw you. Oh, that's the Woolly Cat. I just saw that. Beautiful. Um, easily distractible, clearly. <laughs> but um, you have lovely farm yarn. Will you um, share with us a little something about your flock? Certainly. I have a long wool flock a small flock of 20 ewes and they are crossed with bfl and romney and some romadale so it's a little bit softer than normal romney but it still has shine to it and uh yeah i love my sheep <laughs> how many do you have i have 20 ewes oh so good size so you can make a lot of yarn for us yes and i do and i have all my yarn processed at stonehenge fiber mill in michigan they do an awesome job. You mentioned the luster. It does have, your yarn does have a beautiful luster to it. And you have so many gorgeous colors. And you were saying that you actually do the dyeing. I do. I dye everything um, that I sell. I do carry some luxury yarns also that I hand dye. Um, some yak blends. I have 100% silk, which is very popular, which I love to dye. I have kind of a signature Thing that I do and it is um, hand plied and it's a merino yak and silk and I dye it in singles and I hand ply it all and I have um, big jumbo skeins of it those are popular I don't always have them it depends on if I have time to do that or not but um. I, I have to say I don't remember seeing your farm here in the past is this your first time at the show it is not, but I have not been here since 2018. Okay. It was the so last year. Okay, so I've missed you. Yeah, yeah. I was here, I missed the first year, but from uh, year two to the 18, I was okay. I was here. Okay, yeah, because I think 2019 was my first time here, so that's okay. why I haven't seen you. Okay, another quick question. How long have you been making your wool, and what was it that got you to, like, take that step into processing the fiber yourself? I did this back in the early 90s on a much smaller scale. Then uh, my daughters decided we needed to show quarter horses, so the sheep went, and for until 2008 I started. They were gone, married, so, mm -hmm. and uh, I started it, doing it again, and I said, I there's no way I'm going to do dyeing and all that stuff again. Well, here I am. <laughs> And the like a double <laughs> slash triple booth, you're, you're clearly doing a lot of it. Yeah, and that's my passion. I I don't get time to do a lot of knitting, unfortunately, but I just love to to dye. And I'm a I'm not a scientist. I'm more of an artistic dyer. I dye everything by eye. I tweak all my colors, mm -hmm. and I guess more like painting a picture rather than yeah. measuring and doing. So do you do you try to replicate popular batches or are you just sort of on to the next thing? Both. 
I do a lot of one of a kind things, and I also am pretty good with replicating them. They're close enough to be another die lot, um, just by looking. Although my memory isn't as good as it used to be. I used to remember everything I put in it, and now I'm like, <laughs> but I start to write things down, and by the end of the day, oh, I only wrote two things. <laughs> so I gave up. It's it's more of a, it's kind of like I cook. Yeah. Little of this, little of that. A little bit of flavoring. Yeah. Yep. yeah. If people are curious and want to see your yarn and maybe pick some up, do you have a website? I do have a website, the Wool Room at Longmeadow Farm. The farm shop is closed now due to a lot of shows, but it will... It will open up again this winter. I also have a shop at my farm. This is all set up at the farm, so by appointment, anybody can come and shop there. And the website will shop will be back open this winter. After you're done traveling. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. So I'm here with Paula from the Dancing Pony Sheep Farm. How are you doing today? Doing great. And uh, you have a lovely booth here. You've got gorgeous colors in your walls. Um, you have Jacob sheep. And I was curious if you could tell us something about um, what makes Jacob a great, a great fiber for knitters to work with. Oh, Jacob is a lovely fiber for knitters because it's a fine fiber, uh, soft, but it has really, really good body. So when you knit with it, it holds its shape. That is very good. We have issues with some yarns not doing that, don't we? <laughs> so you have some natural shades here. Is um, How are you getting these different shades? Jacob's sheep are polka dotted sheep. They're black and white polka dotted. And so depending on which combination of fleeces I put in to mix, that'll dictate the degree of gray to brown to white. So with the Jacobs, every year, the the blend is going to be different yeah so i see you have a brown and a blend do you save your whites to dye on no actually i prefer to dye on my silvers and my grays i have dyed on white you can see over there the really really bright garish colors i call that my sassy line vivid vivid okay vivid um so that's my sassy line and then my my gray dyed are my classy line yeah so do you have a website where you sell? I don't have a website. I just have my farm, my email address, and my phone number. So if people want to reach you, how do they do that? They could reach me at my email, which is P M Aarons, A-A-R-O-N-S, at gmail.com. Thank you so much. Thank you. I am Nancy Sharon, and my farm is Windridge Farm in Ashburnham, Mass. You have a couple of Teeswater sheep here at the festival, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what qualities the fleeces have that uh, knitters would benefit from. So the Teeswater sheep is a very uh, wonderful animal. I like the animal themselves. The, what I like about their fiber is for knitting or weaving, that kind of thing, is that it has a lot of luster and shine. So as a dyed yarn or roving it's the, it's just going to pick that up beautifully the other thing is because of the luster and shine it gives the material you're making a very silky feeling I also like it to um, blend in with other fleeces because you could blend either on the animal or blend fleeces and so they they complement each other you will get a fiber that is longer and stronger and has some highlights to it and you will also if you're blending to a maybe a fine wool you'll get some loft so those things all put together just make a luscious luscious fiber to spin or knit with how long is the staple typically because they look they're definitely a long wool yes they are a long wool um their staple can grow quite long um i don't like it to get longer than five or six inches but in a year's time it easily can 
which might be great for hand spinners that want to do that themselves, but as far as sending it to the mill for processing, it might not be possible because it's too long and the machines can't handle it. It's also a really nice fiber to use for weaving. We've done some blanket projects. We have another blanket project I'm bringing uh, fiber up for this week, and it just really, really makes a nice product that way. And it's very, uh, I feel it wears really well too. It's a, it's a strong fiber. Um, it's one of the, it is the um, softest or silkiest of the long wools. But I also feel that it's not a bra as abrasive to the skin as some of the other long wools might be or coarser wool um, sheep because that silkiness just takes away the harshness. So it can be really, really pleasant to, to work with. It's easy to spin because it's long and it's, it just slides right through your hands onto the wheel. Um, it's very pleasant to work with. Um, and I, like, I just like its characteristics. And great to dye. Sorry, great to dye. And I see you do have roving and yarn here. Is this all teaswater or is this a blend? No. I have um, some teaswater roving from the two sheep that are here. They're hogget fleece from last year. We have some other tees water roving from one of our members also. I have a lot of blends here with me today, which are very popular and make a super nice product. If people want to have a look at your products, do you have a website? I do have a website. Uh, we're kind of in this ongoing process of keeping it updated. My website is www.wind-ridge-farm.com. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm here with Amanda from Junction Fiber Mill, and you have a beautiful setup here uh, with some very brightly colored yarns. Do you want to tell us about your mill? Yeah, so my partner Peggy and I started Junction Fiber Mill a year and a half ago, February 2021. We do both custom processing and then we use a portion of our milling capacity to do our own lines of yarn. So we've got uh, Making Tracks, which is a variegated marled yarn that we dye in the roving. And then we have a heathered line of yarn that we dye in the loose wool that is over here. It's called Trail Mix. And then we've got Farm Fresh, which is um, basically local farm yarn that we spin and dye in small batches. Do you know offhand how many farms are bringing their fiber to you? Yeah, we've got about a hundred small farms that we work with, which is kind of crazy that we've only been open for like a year and a half. Um, we've just been honored at the trust that the farmers have like put in, into our business and a lot of repeat customers, which has felt like very rewarding. Excellent. Is there a minimum if people want to have fiber processed with you? There is a minimum for cost, which is 13 pounds, but we have processed batches as low as like five or six pounds. We've done single fleeces. For roving, it's lower. It's like seven pounds for roving. So you, you can have roving, just processed as far as roving for people. Yep, we do roving and pin drafted roving as well, which is a little bit finer of a product. It's got the, the fibers are a little bit more aligned. Um, it's fabulous to hand spin. So why did you get into owning a mill? Oh boy. Yeah. Well, there was a pandemic um, and I was doing web development and design before this. And uh, my partner, who was kind of like my sheep mentor, and I just decided to completely change careers and start a fiber mill. I can't give you any specific reasons other than things were in chaos and we wanted to make something real. So we both love to knit. We have sheep. We love yarn. So we thought, why not start a fiber mill? And so I think with her, we managed to make it make it work um, as partners I don't think I would have ever been able to do it by myself <laughs> that is an amazing story I love the idea you know you get it in your head and you you take the steps you get it done right Yes, we have had some really interesting live and learns. We've both gotten sort of the 101 on like mill maintenance and mechanics. Um, there's a lot of grease involved. It's, it's interesting. We got into this for the love of like soft, squishy wool and animals. And like what we got is these jobs of mill workers, which is very different, but we both love them. So I bet you have very, very soft skin at this point. Uh, it's pretty soft, but also like we're constantly washing our hands because they're full of grease. So <laughs> So if people want to find uh, your mill and the yarns that you produce, how can they, how can they find you? We are at Junction Fiber Mill on Instagram, and um, we're on Facebook as well. Um, they can also send us an email at hello at junctionfibermill.com, and we're junctionfibermill.com on the internet. 
Do you have a place for people to come by and shop? We sure do. We are doing retail hours at the mill Tuesday to Friday from 1 to 4. Check on Instagram just in case our milling schedule doesn't allow for that on a given day. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. I'm here with Liz of the Funsy Bunny. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I am doing great. I am ready to go home, though. I've been hauling this bag around for a while now, and I'm getting a little sweaty. It is hot here today. It is hot here today. Usually it's a nice, cool fall festival, but it's yeah. surprise weather. Yeah. I think it's supposed to be like 75 today, which is kind of ridiculous. Yes, I'm not ready for that. I'm ready for winter now. I wanted to talk to you about a couple of the products that you have um, in your booth here, but do you want to just maybe first just sort of tell us um, what, you're, what you have, what you are, why you're here? Sure. So uh, as the Fuzzy Bunny, I started off as a hand dyer. Um, so I have a lot of hand dyed yarn, a little bit of roving. And then I opened a yarn shop a few years ago. And so I bring more stuff with me now. So that includes a lot of knitting needles and notions. Uh, so I didn't know about the yarn shop before we started this. Where's that located? So the Fuzzy Bunny brick and mortar is in Honeywood, New York, which is about an hour south of Rochester. And do you do anything like extra fun there? Do you host knit nights or anything like that? Of course. So every Saturday we do Crafternoon. So people come and it's not just knitting. It's any craft that people want to do. And sometimes people like my mom show up and like paint shutters too. So anything goes. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love that. So you have a couple products here that I um, was very curious about. And the first were these very interesting uh, knitting needles. They appear to be from Germany. Can you tell us about those? So this is, the brand is called Nico, and the needles are Strickspiel, which um, I've been told translates to knitting game in German. I can't really verify that. That's just what people told me. Um, <laughs> but they are bent needles. They started with just plastic, and they've grown their line quite a bit. So they have features like a hole so that you can run a... Um, a lifeline across your knitting or you can bind off all at once like you can just put your yarn through and take all the stitches at the top of a hat off at once um, and they've recently expanded to have bamboo needles as well and there is actually a newer needle that I don't have with me but I do have in the shop that instead of a metal join on the bamboo it's plastic and so they're sort of they're not quite 90 degrees and you get three of them in the package Right, and so the the idea is that it's like a DPN but modified so that you don't have as many fiddly pieces and um, you can toss it in your knitting bag and your needles never fall out of your knitting. Excellent. I did get a pair. I'm looking forward to trying those out on a project soon. And then of all your beautiful yarn here, you have some really lovely colors, but I really wanted to ask you about um, this one that you have at the end, the Ultra Local. Can you tell us about that one? Sure. So um, a lot of my business, I've been trying to be as sustainable as possible. So I had a friend approach me who's actually here teaching spinning today. Um, and she Marcia? went, it is Marsha. That's who I had my class oh, with. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she is, uh, I don't know if she told you in your, in your class, but she's undeniably loopy. That's her business. I didn't know that. okay. Yeah. So she has gone out and sourced wool from sheep farmers who are local to me. Um, really, really close, uh, and so had it custom spun into this lace weight yarn at a New York mill, and then she showed up with all of this yarn, like hundreds and hundreds of skeins, which is pretty exciting to see. Um, and so I've just been playing with plants. So um, most of the yarn on the bottom here is, so it's all blues and greens, and that was indigo that I grew in my own garden. And I've been playing a lot with fresh indigo dyeing, which gives you more of a teal or tur turquoise color. And then up top um, are kind of yellows, browns, oranges, and those are all flowers that I've grown in my garden. Or, you know, I have a seven acre property, so I have essentially seven acres of goldenrod. So I've used a lot of that too. Yeah, they're lovely soft colors, um, and they look like they'd all work together really well in a project. Yeah. And I just have been having a really good time with plants. Um, and this summer I went down and I took a class on how to dye with mushrooms. So there is one skein in there. It's a nice yellow and it's dyed with a giant porcini mushroom that we foraged, which is pretty great. You get yellow from porcini mushrooms? Yes. So you can get a full rainbow out of mushrooms. You just have to know which ones to find. It's amazing. That is incredible. 
Thank you so much for talking with me. Can you tell people if they want to pick up some of this ultra local or are interested in any of your other products, how do they connect with you? They can find me at fuzzybunnyyarn.com and contact me through the website and I'd be happy to talk with them by email and send them some, some fun yarn. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm here with Sylvia from the Connecticut Sheep Breeders Association, and you have a beautiful selection of blankets here of all different sizes from Connecticut sheep growers. I was wondering if you could tell me why blankets? Blankets are something that everyone can use. The motto of the association was to promote things for our members and to promote sheep farming in general. Joe Judge started the project a long, very long time ago. This is blanket number 20 is our most recent so that means we've been doing it for 20 years probably just with this company before that we started with a company called Charles House um, and he was very interested mostly in buying this wool from 4-H kids he wanted to promote the kids and you know and to give them an income so to speak from their sheep and then from there he um, opened it up to other producers and his deal was they made them and you could buy them back at a reduced cost from them. Once Charles House went out of business, then we picked up with a new producer. And so now what happens is you have to be a member of the association and you have to have certain breeds of sheep. We can't accept what they call primitive breeds because they have a coarse coat. Um, so it's all nice wool, so it's not scratchy. Mm -hmm. And then you bring your wool to what we call wool collection. And at wool collection, we go through your fleece, you put it up on a table, and you're supposed to have cleaned it up first. So there's no hay and chaff or dirty things in it. And we put it up and inspect it. And if it meets our standards, we'll, we'll accept it. If it doesn't, you go home with it. We have, that's our quality control aspect. And so based on how many pounds you've put in, you can now order blankets. And so each blanket has a specific requirement. A king blanket takes 14 pounds of raw wool, all the way down to a scarf, which takes one pound, which was crucial because we want to be able to serve all of our members. We don't want to just cater to the ones who have several fleeces so even that person with one sheep can at least get scarves that way we didn't limit it from there they pay their manufacturing fee and the wool leaves us and it goes down to South Carolina and it gets washed and then it returns to New England where it gets carded and spun and woven into the fabric and then it goes and gets cut into the different sizes that we've ordered and we go up to the mill when it's time and pick up the, all of the blankets. And we have a crew of members that go. And so like Pete Seppi will come and he will take all of the blankets that go to his section of the state. And somebody else will come and take them to their section of the state so that we don't have to have everybody try and meet in one place. And then the farmers are free to take them home and sell them if they want or they keep them a lot of people will just get a few and then because they make really good wedding presents and graduation presents or our most popular blanket is a long throw and it's because you can sit in the recliner and you can pull it up to your neck and wrap it around your feet and it keeps you warm while you watch tv uh, how do you how do you take care of a wool blanket like for people who've never owned one before what do they need to expect as far as care do not wash it in the washing machine. <laughs> um, they can either take it to the cleaners. Um, a lot of times you can just take it and hang it outside and air dry it for a few days. Um, the other thing that I've done with mine is in the grocery store you can buy dry L or wool light dry cleaner sheets that you put in your dryer. And it gets tumbled like for 20 minutes, I think the directions say. And that gets out a lot of the dirt and stuff. And that's how I've been successful doing mine that way. But really with a wool blanket, it's going to resist a lot of dirt and stains anyway. Yes, it, you, it does. And, and it breathes so that when you put it on you, it's not like a plastic blanket, I'll call it. 
that you know just keeps all the moisture there the, you know your moisture can get out of the way and go and it's just they're comfy all year round I love sleeping under wool. It's a, it's a new experience for me, and I sleep so much better than under, like, a plastic-filled duvet, you know. To have a wool one is so much nicer. Yes. So if people are interested in becoming part of the project and contributing wool to it, how would they get in touch with you? First, they need to get, to, uh, well, they can call, they can um, email me at s murray m u r r a y at c t sheep dot com and then um they would need to join the membership join the association because it's only open to members and the wool has to be from connecticut sheep we don't take people from out of state because of that and if someone's interested in getting a blanket how does that happen well, they can either go around to different fairs and farmers markets and find someone that sells them there. Um, you can come to an event like this, the Fiber Festival of New England, and we have a booth there. Um, our annual Sheep and Wool Festival um, is held the last Saturday of every April, always on the last Saturday. And it's now being held at North Haven Fairgrounds. That was, this is be the second year that we'll be at North Haven. Is there a website or a phone number they could, they could use? Yes, they can also go to the website, www.ctsheep.com, and there's a blanket page there, and people who want to sell them, not everybody wants to sell theirs, uh, people who want to sell them, some of them have put their names on a list there, and you can see the list of all the farms. Each um, blanket comes with a certificate that has the name of everybody who participated in that blanket. So they can go online there and look. And um, they can find, you know, like those separate farms and order on, like, you know, order it through them. And most people will mail them. Thank you so much for your time today, Sylvia. You're welcome. So I'm here with Lindsay from the Fiber Seed. And this is your first time coming to the Fiber Festival of New England. Is that right? It is. And how did day one go for you? fantastic it was so busy there were so many people and it was so much fun well you have a gorgeous display and you have a wonderful location I actually came in the door down there and was immediately facing your booth so I was like well I know where to find Lindsay later that was very advantageous I saw it too when I was coming back from the food court I was like oh look you can see our sign straight from the middle of the aisle so you have um, your sprout yarn, which is your own base. Do you want to tell people about that? Yes. So it's a 90-10 superwash merino nylon blend, and it's U.S. sheep. It is all grown here, processed here, and we dye it here in the United States. So, Excellent. And you have a wide range of colors and uh, different types of dye methods that you use. Are there any that you came up with this year that you're particularly fond of? I think meshing very bright bold colors which was my wheelhouse before we moved to Ohio I used to live in Florida meshing those with subtle colors which I expanded upon when I moved to Ohio because there wasn't much bright inspiration there at first in the winter so meshing those two together has been a lot of fun this year so do you tend to draw inspiration from the nature around you or where do you look for inspiration as you're coming up with new colorways most of my inspiration comes from nature a lot of times what I can see out of my dye studio window but also, there are, you know, children's books, because I have two kids, so I get a lot of inspiration from different illustrators um, that way, as well as artists and other things like that. So, nature, world around me, music sometimes. Do you have any plans coming up that you want to uh, tell people about? So many plans <laughs> that have not been made yet. They're in my head swirling around. No, there, we have a lot of things that we're looking forward to in the next year. We're going to a lot of fiber shows, but um, we're looking at new things like kits, fun boxes, things like that. Excellent. So if people want to keep up to date on those, how do they find you online? So you'll want to, if you're on Instagram, look for underscore the fiber seed. If you're on Facebook, we're the fiber seed. And you can also check out our website, thefiberseed.com. And you do online sales there, of course, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Lindsay. You're so welcome. I hope you enjoyed that little look at the Fiber Festival of New England. It happens every November on the first weekend of November, Saturday and Sunday. 
So be sure to check the show notes for the website and maybe I'll see you there next year. A few more things before we go. Wovember is proceeding apace over on Instagram. This is a posting challenge where you use the prompts I released as inspiration and make daily posts on your own feed about wool with that prompt in mind. There are four prizes up for grabs. One is for best photo, one for best writing, one for making a post for all 30 prompts, and one for someone who wore wool and posted about it using the hashtags wearwool and lovewovember. Lovewovember.com is also a new website that is up. I have had members of the wool community who have contributed their story, their experiences with wool, thoughts about wool, information about wool. Every day a new post is going live there, so you can check out lovewovember.com just independent of the posting prompt if you're not on Instagram. I have had some more people come forward and ask if they can offer prizes, so there is at least one more prize coming, possibly two. So to learn more about Wovember and join in, hop over to Instagram. All the posts about the prizes and the prompts are there on my feed, which you can find by searching for and following at I Thought I Knew How. Secondly, I have started filming interviews with Jana of Pearl Together over on YouTube with the makers involved with the Shetland Hogmany yarn box and with the advent box Jana ordered this year for herself. We will be doing our daily vlog event through the month of December as we open our yarn boxes together. We have had a great time so far meeting all these creative designers and dyers. If you'd like to join us in December, be sure to go over to YouTube and subscribe to Pearl Together. Then start looking for those vlogs to appear on December 1st. Finally, I heard from a listener over in Austria who offered me some insights into the wool scene there. Now, if you remember, I believe it was last episode, it may have been the episode before, when I talked about being there in Austria and not actively looking for wool, but still looking for wool, and how uh, I, I did speak with a textile historian who told me that there weren't very many people who were raising sheep there still for wool, and that it was more hobby farms, and so I, I heard from uh, Walter Igner, and I do apologize if I said your name wrong, Walter, and I'm probably going to get several things pronounced wrong as I'm reading through his letter. He wrote a very kind letter, and I want to uh, share that with you so that you have a better understanding of the wool scene in Austria. So he says, Dear Anne, it's a pleasure to have found you online. I just listened to your podcast about your trip to Austria. As you might guess, I'm Austrian. There are about 730,000 sheep in Austria, which is about half of the sheep in Germany and almost double the number in Switzerland. So if you know where to look, you would see them. And yes, you're right, it's mainly meat, with the minority looking for the milk. Next week, I will film at Loden Walker. They started almost 600 years ago, and they have turned into a wonderful company, but around 99% of their wool is from outside of Europe. But we also have Gottstein, a company in the Tyrol using wool from rare European breeds to manufacture wonderful slippers. And we still have old spinners like Huber Wool in the south of Salzburg working with local wool for knitting. Plus, there's a huge scene of hand knitters and wool lovers. To give you one example, let me introduce you to Die Handwerkstatte in Styria. Sabine has her own podcast in German about die Wollen, meaning your wool in her local dialect. So there will be plenty of people to meet if you ever happen to be in Austria again, and the same applies for other European countries. I'm working on a documentary about the underutilized European wool. For more than 20 years, I was manufacturing handwoven area rugs, mainly from wool, and after leaving this company, I got inspired by a conversation with a friend to start working on the documentary about 18 months ago. So I'm enjoying my trips throughout Europe and meeting shepherds, plus many people who work with wool. Keep up your great work. Kind regards from Austria, Walter. Thank you. Thank you, Walter, for taking the time. I now want to go back to Austria. First of all, it was just a great visit. It was a really lovely place to be. And so I already wanted to go back to Austria, but now I really want to go back to Austria and try and connect up with some of these manufacturers and other podcasters and see if I can get connected with some of the local hand knitters. And uh, let's see if we can make that happen. I'm also very interested 
in Walter's upcoming documentary. I think that is going to be a fascinating addition to the discussion that we're all having about wool, you know, in general, but especially now during November when we focus on wool so much. So thank you again, Walter, for your kind correction and filling me in. And I am very glad to hear about all of the wonderful wool production that is going on in Austria. I will be back in two weeks with episode 89. And in the meantime, thank you for listening and knitting with me for a bit. If you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash I thought I knew how to make a monthly pledge. You may also consider a purchase from one of our sponsors by visiting the website I thought I knew how.com and clicking the link at the top that says be a booster. While you are on the site, you can also find the show notes for each episode. Thank you ever so much to my patrons, to Knit New Haven, and to Morehouse Farm for sponsoring the podcast. Find me on my social media accounts as I thought I knew how, except on Twitter, where it's just thought I knew how. The groups on various platforms are all called I Thought I Knew How Podcast. Until next time, may you be blessed with stitches that never drop, yarn without joints, and plenty of time to knit. Knit. <laughs>